Welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. Featuring sysadmin expert, Don Pizzette. Security specialist, Daniel Lowry. And Peter. Hello and welcome to Technado with Don Pizzette. I'm your host, Peter Van Rysdam, and we are joined this week, shockingly, by Don Pizzette, who uh, took last week off of his own podcast. Don, how you doing? Hey, I am doing great. Back from vacation, so I was a little bit disconnected from uh, technology for a while, which was nice, but I am glad to be back. Nothing more relaxing than a week with your family. Him, uh, well, my wife's family, so it's even better. <laughs> Sense the sarcasm in my voice. Aren't I? Does your wife listen to the show? Hopefully not. Okay, no. perfect. <laughs> and we are joined again by Wes Bryan. Wes, how are you? Hey, great to be back. Uh, doing good. We uh, we had such good reviews last week of your performance. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. So we invited you back. Ronnie, not so much. That's why. Oh, is that why he's not here? Yeah, oh, he's not here. man. There's a lot of hate mail. It was surprising. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we are also joined this week by the co-founder and CEO of Horizon3.ai, Snehal and Tani. How are you doing today? Excellent. Great to catch up with you guys. And we and appreciate you uh, coming all the way across the country uh, to see us, but you, you missed our state by a few, so... Uh, traveling for work there. <laughs> yep, exactly. You're, yeah. you, that's how it is these days. All right. Well, I got to admit, I, I looked at your background. I knew a lot of the companies you work for. I don't know a lot about Horizon3.ai, so I'm excited to get to know you and learn more about that in our first segment, which is Rapid Fire Questions. Who do you work for? What's new? Who are you? What's happening? What's wrong with you? All right, Sneha, in this segment, what we're going to do is give you a couple of minutes to answer some questions, approximately one minute per question. And if you take too long to answer, Peter will buzz you like that. <laughs> and then we'll move on to the next question. And we're going to rotate through each of us. And we're going to start with Peter. All right. So I get the easy one. So can you give us kind of the overview, the, the high level uh, uh, introduction to Horizon3.ai? Yeah, perfect. So um, how do you look at yourself through the eyes of the attacker so you know your blind spots, your ineffective controls? And you can find and fix security problems before criminals can exploit them. That's at the nutshell of what we do. And it's based on this idea from the military of looking at your environment through the eyes of the adversary. Because until you've actually been breached, you have no idea if you're logging the right data, you're securing the right infrastructure, your data is protected. And by the time you deal with a breach, it's too late. So how do we help you proactively identify your security problems using continuous automated pen testing? Stan, I've got a two-part question for you. What led you uh, to find, you know, to found the company, and uh, was there a problem in the market? If so, what, um, you know, what set you, you know, that you set out to fill? Yeah, it's an excellent question. So, myself as a co-founder, I've been a CIO before. I've been in that practitioner seat, and I've uh, been in the seat where I've gotten a, a vulnerability report that had a hundred thousand vulnerabilities on my environment, of which maybe five or ten could actually be exploited by attackers, and I had no idea where to start. I would get a pen test report from some, some consulting firm whose job was to show up and poke my team in the eye. And we'd have all these problems that were one, incomplete because they, we couldn't afford for them to assess everything. Uh, so what little they assessed was incomplete, but they found a bunch of problems. And maybe two or three weeks later, the environment has changed because things are dynamic these days. And so I had to deal with these incomplete snapshots and I wanted to understand what were my problems when I go off and fix them, did I actually fix them or not? And so the pain is that I felt blind. I felt like I didn't know where to start. And by doing continuous automated pen testing, at least I had a starting point from which I could say for sure that here's how an attacker could get in, combine together a password they found in one place with a misconfiguration in another and a vulnerability in the third and a dangerous product default in the fourth place and how that attacker could have combined these to steal my data. And that would at least give me a starting point for where to prioritize and focus my resources. Because the hardest part of my job in cybersecurity was deciding what not to do and how do I use that attacker's perspective to prioritize and fix and find and fix what matters. All right, now let's talk a little bit about how you got started because you weren't always a CEO, right? So if we go back in time, and we, we won't say how far back in time, uh, to, to your days at IBM, you got your start at IBM as an intern and kind of worked your way up through that uh, to become a, let's see, what were you? Uh, a, a product manager. I'm curious, you, I've heard different stories of people who came out of IBM. Some people say it was a great experience that really set them up with a great foundation of knowledge. Other people say it taught them the way they used to do things, not the way they should. What, what was your experience like? How did that set you up? 
Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I graduated undergrad um, in 2002, but I'd interned in 2000, 2001 at IBM. And that's right at the dot-com crash. And this is pre-Google, pre-Facebook. And at the time, like the, the, com- the elite companies to go work for were Microsoft, Sun Microsystems, IBM, and a, and a handful of others. And what I loved about my, t- my early days at IBM is I was working on the mainframe, which at first you think is an antiquated system, but it's a system that has been honed and tuned over decades of time. I mean, mainframes help put people on the moon, mainframes power most of the banks today, and being able to understand that environment, but mostly be surrounded by these folks at IBM that were incredibly wise. They were technologists, they had significant technical depth and breadth, and they had this culture of, for those that were hungry and wanted to learn, challenging and helping them discover their plateaus. So my early days of IBM, nobody told me I couldn't work on something or that I wasn't capable or qualified. It was up to me to decide what I could and couldn't work on. And I was able to discover my plateau and discover my passions and interests. Um, I also learned a lot about uh, what not to do, right? When you think about IBM, at the end of the day, we see this now, their primary objective was to Uh, do just enough product to issue a dividend to shareholders. So oftentimes they'd enter a market not to win, but to get good enough. And I learned a lot about the difference between playing to win a market versus playing not to lose in a market. And so with every one of my jobs, I've learned a lot on the positive side. I've learned a lot on what not to do as well. And it's uh, being able to reflect and synthesize on those experiences at all levels and take those lessons learned and set the conditions to be able to do it myself. And same thing, even in the startup today, I'm sure there are things we're doing really well and there are uh, mistakes that we're making that the next generation of leader is going to look at and incorporate into their uh, professional life. So so getting back to Horizon3.ai, I know you guys um, recently launched a certified partner program for uh, your automated pen testing as a service. So what, what does the partner program entail? How does someone get involved with that? Yeah, so, you know, the challenge, and I saw this both as a customer and practitioner in security, as well as as a startup founder in security, which is we would have managed security service providers or other security vendors that would show how awesome their stuff was in PowerPoint. But when push came to shove, uh, it either didn't work or it was my burden to figure out how to tie things together. And I had no way to use data to understand the quality of that security provider. And so as a result, I'm a bit blind in my faith in the people that were providing services to me when I was a CIO. On the flip side, when we were at, at Horizon 3 and we started running pen tests against organizations, we would gain access, find their data, show how their data could be stolen and cover our tracks all automatically with no humans in the loop in 15, 20 minutes. And it would take six or seven hours for the managed security services provider to send a generic alert saying, hey, we think there is nefarious activity going on. And 15 minutes versus a seven hour response time, the the adversary is gonna win every time. And so what we realized is as we run more pen tests, we will have the data to show the detection and reaction time by these security providers. How quickly can they detect our presence How quickly do they take our findings and actually fix them and verify that they're no longer a problem? And by taking that data, we were able to have a data-driven way to rate the quality of a managed security services provider to say, these guys are good and these guys aren't. And oftentimes, it's the smaller, hungrier shops that care very much about security that tend to perform the best. And so with our certified program, the way to to become certified is you have to start using the product to find, fix, and verify your security problems and also use the product to help measure the reaction time of your defensive tools. And only once you've hit certain thresholds and criteria, for example, 90% of the critical findings that are discovered are remediated in less than 24 hours, uh, that your detection time falls within a particular response time, only then will you get the certification And there's no way for a partner to buy it. You can't buy yourself into the upper right quadrant. It is only based on the actual data and results of your actions that the system is able to elevate and say, hey, this person now exceeds the threshold. They are considered uh, node zero certified. 
That's really cool. We'll talk a little bit uh, about how people can uh, get involved with that and find out more information about you guys. I got to be honest, you know, I'm paying attention, but I'm just so focused. It, is the art behind you? It's like, is it a paint splash or I'm seeing a praying mantis now. <laughs> it's like a Rorschach test. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. I don't know what that says about me or my relationship with my mother, but uh, I'm seeing I'm seeing a praying mantis there. So I go straight to I'm in a hotel. I can only imagine what the black light will uncover on that. Movie. Sure, that's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah. That, that could be one of those cool black light posters too. You, could, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. Uh, so I want to talk with you uh, while we have you here about um, something that's kind of up your alley and, and an opinion you have about the relationship between vulnerability and exploitability, uh, and that those are are not the same. And and. I feel like from based on its definition, if, if you've got a vulnerability, that's something that can be exploited. So can you explain what you mean that those are, are not equal? Yeah. So this comes back to the origin story. Of, so when I was a CIO, I would get these vulnerability scanning reports that said I had 100,000 vulnerabilities in my system, critical vulnerabilities. And as you go through this process of looking at those vulnerabilities, you realize that the checks that were applied we're not whether an active exploit existed or the ease of exploitation in your environment in that specific configuration, but rather they were generic software version tests. Like based on this version of Apache, uh, we believe, you know, a vulnerability scanner tool would tell you, we think you have a critical finding and you've got to go upgrade that version of Apache. Well, if you double click on the actual problem and you read how it can be exploited, in that case, uh, it would require, say, physical access to the network backplane in the data center in order to, to exploit it. Well, yeah, you've got the vulnerability based on the version, but is it truly exploitable or highly likely to be exploitable or not? And when you look at the criteria that we started to use, it, it ended up going down this list of, does an exploit actually exist for this vulnerability? Um, Kenna Security did this great research project where they said, less than 2% of vulnerabilities out there actually have exploits or known exploits that are available for use. And of that 2%, uh, less than a fraction of a percent has actually been exploited in the wild. So the first question is, if you've got a vulnerability, does an exploit actually exist? The second is, how complex is that exploitation? Does it require uh, complex or impractical conditions to be met or not? Is the component actually in use? Because oftentimes vulnerability scanning tools don't check those level of details. They give a surface uh, level of analysis saying that this generic version, uh, we assume has the component turned on and most likely it, it isn't. Uh, being outdated in your software doesn't mean it's exploitable. You have to understand that there's a specific vulnerability that's active or there is a high easy complexity or an exploit exists uh, and then the context, where are you in the network? So for example, you could have a, a critical blue key vulnerability, but if it is on a lab machine that is segmented off, that does not enable data theft or critical systems disruption, is it really that critical to, to go out and, and remediate? And so network context also drives prioritization. And so the hardest part of the job is deciding what not to do and when you think about any vulnerability, what you want to understand is, can it be exploited? And does the impact require I cancel lunch or skip lunch and cancel plans with my family? Never. Or is this yet another problem to solve in the backlog of work I've got to go do? You know, I am curious about that because if you're a if you're a blue teamer or a sysadmin, network admin, whatever, you're responsible for defending your network. There's there's databases like the MITRE database, the, the CVE mm -hmm. database. But that lets us stay on top of what vulnerabilities are out there, but it is just vulnerabilities, right? A CVE is common vulnerability and exposure. Exposure. There mm -hmm. we go. Not exploits, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you keep track of which ones have actually been exploited? I'm not aware of a database or anything that would, that would tell me that. It's even worse. So we talk about CVEs. Most cyber attacks don't even require CVEs to be exploited. I'll give you an example. If we take Technado. I will go to, an attacker could go to LinkedIn to find all of the employees of Technado. Of those employees, statistically over 50% reuse passwords. So you might reuse your Netflix password for your corporate email. And uh, common password reuse or weak passwords is a typical way to get in so that attackers don't have to 
uh, leverage zero days or other exploits like in the movies, they often just log in with valid credentials that they've harvested somewhere else. And so you can get all the employee names from LinkedIn. You're going to password spray to figure out uh, who has a weak password or who has reused their password. Once, once they've gained initial access, they're going to continue this cycle of, can I find other user IDs, other domain users? Can I elevate privileges to domain admin? And most attacks, even malware you, or ransomware, you don't need active CVEs to be exploited. You can chain together a credential that you've harvested from one place with a misconfiguration in Jenkins with a poor default in VMware and gain complete access to an environment. So this over rotation and focus on CVEs is part of the problem because it's how attackers chain these things together that's important. Well, to prove your point, yeah, we, we looked around the room when you said that, and and uh, thirty three percent of us raised their hand. Uh, I use <laughs> Technado one uh, for the password for everything. Oh, well, now it's out. But the the, the good thing is you uh, can change it after the show to Technado two. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> capital T. Uh, Don has uh, has given me uh, zero trust, so I have I have no access to actually anything. So you could log in with that stuff, and it's not going to get you anywhere. So vulnerabilities, you know, with all the stars having to align, the planets align, and everything doesn't equate to exploitability or severity on the blue team's part. That's what it sounds like. That's exactly it. Mm -hmm. And and I mean, to your point earlier, you were saying, you know, you get that list of 100,000 things. I mean, when you have that much, you're not going to look through it and you're not going to see where the real problems are. So so a system like yours is saying, yeah, these things exist, but here's the four that you need to focus on today that could actually be exploited, right? Yeah. And, and actually, even more interesting is attackers have adapted. They know that vulnerability management programs focus on the the eights, nines, and tens, like the most critical problems that you have. And so what they do is they figure out how to make a low plus a low equal a high. It's how they combine the ones and the twos uh, in terms of severity that you're never going to get to and never pay attention to. But it's how they chain those together with other misconfigurations that are never going to surface as a vulnerability. For example, if you don't encrypt your VMware backups, that is not a vulnerability. There is no, no issue with the product uh, that you're going to that you're going to report or show up in the CV database, but if you don't encrypt your VMware backups, there are MTD files that have the actual user admin user ID password stored in them that you're going to be able to access, parse the binaries, and pull out. So that's not a vulnerability. It's not going to show up in a scanner. But attackers know that if they find your vCenter environment and it is it is not encrypted, they are going to get valid admin credentials and they will log into your domain controller or log into your production VMware environment and have the keys to the kingdom. And so with attackers, it's, they don't focus on the nines and tens when they're exploiting. They're looking at the how they can combine issues under the radar that you don't have time to pay attention to in order to gain access and achieve their objectives. That makes sense. And so it, I know you guys are talking at Black Hat coming up. Is it this, this same topic or, or something else? Yeah, we've got um, we've got a, a bunch of activities at, at Black Hat. One cool thing about Horizon Three is a third of the company are veterans from the special operations community, and really the the, the core company DNA is uh, retired special operations personnel. That and we think about special ops. What makes somebody special in that community is not that they're a fast runner or a great swimmer, but rather they are learn it alls that can work as a team to solve any problem under tremendous pressure. Special operations folks are incredible problem solvers. That's what makes them unique. And my co-founder came from the special operations community. A third of the company are veterans from the US services uh, that are US Special Operations Command that came from that community. And that's really the core DNA. So we have a number of veterans focused events at Black Hat, uh, helping transitioning veterans, uh, helping to galvanize those that have served and so on. We have a number of um, we call it lobby con, right? Just being able to hang out and meet with our folks in the lobby. Mm. We've got cabanas. And really it's, it's um, our brand of the company is authentic badass. We have very few salespeople. We have very few marketing people. It's very much practitioners that have been in the job that, have, that can, as a result, uh, articulate and empathize with what you're going through and help you as that subject matter expert navigate through it. Uh, and that's really the culture of the company. Even though we have no consulting and no professional services business, we are a straight up software as a service company that does continuous automated pen testing. But that that empathetic practitioner culture 
uh, is how we deliver customer success to our users. All right, so I've got an idea. I'm going to pitch you just a you know second product idea. Just if you're interested, you don't have to use this. But since you've got all these you know ex special forces guys and things, as opposed to alerting you know companies to say, hey, here here are your vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities. Just say. Hey, we found where the hackers are, and we've gone and we've executed them. <laughs> in, in we've deployed sleep. a team. <laughs> I mean, it seems like a better way to go. Just yeah, yeah. It's um the, the number of of retired special operations friends of mine that are encouraging me to open up open up a close access business, which is effectively them legally being able to break into buildings. Yeah, is um is through the through the roof. So I'll probably do uh. Uh, hey, how, do you want a, a a retired SEAL to figure out how to break into your office and show how they can steal your data? And then after that, we can think about warheads on foreheads. <laughs> I like, oh, I like that. <laughs> well, if you're looking for Series A, just let me know, and we'll uh, we'll talk about that at that point. Uh, nice. And, and well you played. guys, you guys have uh, uh, some tech talks that you guys do monthly, and, and another one coming up. What what are those all about? Yeah, you know, the other really important part of the security community is, man, we're all tired of being sold to and talked at by vendors and being educated on, for the most part, is, is PowerPoint nonsense. And back to this pr practitioner DNA, how do we talk about an issue like ransomware without a sales pitch for why zero trust is the answer to everything, right? Just tell me about ransomware. What is it? How exactly are these attacker groups uh, gaining so much success? What are they tying together? Talk about it from an attacker's point of view. And then separately talk about it from a defender standpoint. What can I as the defender of the blue team do to protect myself? And if you don't understand how the attackers behave, you will only be, be so successful on the defensive side. So what we do are these monthly podcasts or tech talks where there's no sales. We don't talk about the company. We don't talk about our product. It is offensive practitioners and defensive practitioners talking about you know, how does ransomware work? How, how are they successful? What can you do to defend against it? Before that was a tech talk on uh, being vulnerable doesn't mean you're exploitable. And we actually had the red team talk through a number of examples of leveraging a misconfiguration in Jenkins with a misconfiguration in your DNS to elevate privileges and become a domain, domain administrator with no CVEs being used along the way. And then on the defensive side, what could they do about it? So every month we do these tech talks with offensive and defensive practitioners uh, talking about the world through that pr uh, practitioner's point of view. The next one is next week on Wednesday um, where we're going to talk through ransomware. And you know, we've got all these videos on YouTube uh, of these tech talks uh, from the past few months as well for, for anyone to, to look at. Very cool. Well, uh, if you want to check all that out and uh, and check out the company in general and, and learn about uh, pen testing as a service, uh, you can head over to horizon3.ai. Well, Snehal, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. I know you're you're busy and traveling, so appreciate you finding time for us. No, this is awesome. I appreciate it, and uh, look forward to catching up again in the near future. All right, sounds good. Well, we've got some news to get to. We're going to take a quick break and come back and do that. So stay tuned for more Technado with Don Pizet right after this. Are you a fan of Technado with Don Pizzette? Then show your love by voting for the show in the 16th Annual People's Choice Podcast Awards. To vote, head to podcastawards.com and register. Then you'll be taken to the voting page. Technado with Don Pizzette is under the This Week in Tech Technology category. Thanks for your vote and for your continued support of Technado with Don Pizzette. All right, welcome back to Technator with Don Pizzette. Thank you so much to Snehal for joining us and uh, learning all about how computers are taking more of our jobs and AI is going to take our pen tester shops away from them. Right? <laughs> That's what I took away. Was that wrong? You know, it is interesting. I should have asked him because uh, you know AI is in the company name, but a lot of it's powered by real people. So uh, it's kind of a little misleading you in a way. They're people. Well, it, they could be robots. It's easy to write off all these companies use AI these days because it's kind of BS in a lot of cases. But uh, <laughs> for them, they back it up with real people, so it's cool. Again, again this guy knows special forces people. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't saying that his company is BS in any way, shape, or form. 
<laughs> and I respect everything that they do. Uh, <laughs> hey, before we get to news, I want to let you know, um, yeah, humble brag, we have been nominated uh, by the Podcast Awards or for a Podcast Award from podcastawards.com. It's the People's Choice Awards, and we're in the category of This Week in Tech Technology category, uh, which I assume is based off of Leo Laporte's. Uh, maybe they're like the lifetime recipient of that honor or something. <laughs> uh, so feel free to help us out and go to podcastawards.com. And uh, you have to fill out the little form there and uh, pick TechNado with Don Bizette under uh, that category. And, you know, we'll mention you in the in the speech, I guess. Maybe See that's... what happens. I've attended twice, and now you guys get an award. Uh, yeah. There's a correlation is causation, you know, right? I believe that's how it goes. That, that's, I'm going with that. That's what I've been told. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get to the news and show why we are deserving of this award with our award-winning breakdown. Uh, our first article is from TheVerge.com. Microsoft puts PCs in the cloud with Windows 365. So Windows 365 is a new service that creates cloud PCs. So this is is this different than desktop as a service? Uh, so it isn't. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, you know, it kind of falls in line. And we've talked about this under a few different names over the last couple of years. Uh, what was Windows Virtual Desktop or mm -hmm. WVD? That got renamed it's Azure. Azure. It's Azure, Azure Virtual, Virtual Desktop, Desktop today, yep. yeah. So, uh, so that, that became Azure. And then now we have what's basically the same product again, rebranded once more, which is <laughs> Windows 365. Now, you might say, how is this important since we already know about it? But the Windows 365 name has popped up numerous times over the last five or six years, mm -hmm. and a lot of people felt that it meant that Microsoft was going to move Windows to a subscription model, that when you want to install Windows on your desktop, that you'd pay five bucks a month or, or whatever for your operating system, as opposed to outright purchasing Windows or getting a license when you buy hardware like you do today. They originally had the Office 365 branding, and when they changed that to Microsoft 365, that's when people said, all right, Microsoft's going all subscription. But that's not what's happened. So the Windows 365 name, we now know exactly what that's going to be, and it is a virtual desktop. So you get a cloud-based desktop, and you pay based on the amount of hardware you pick, just like any kind of Azure VM that's out there or exactly like WVD. The difference is this one's designed to be a little more com um, consumer accessible. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to set this up. You just click a few things and you're in there. Very similar to Amazon's workspaces. You know, you just swipe a credit card and now you got a, a persistent desktop. And then from any Windows, Mac, Linux machine, you're able to use remote desktop to connect in and have your common desktop on any machine that you use. They're making a big push towards Chromebooks and mm -hmm. low power devices that'll give you full desktop access now. So that's the idea. Pricing is still a little bit vague on it, but it looks like uh, because it's going to depend on the amount of processors and memory you get, the pricing will vary. So it could range from like $15 to $30 a month. So for some people, mm -hmm. that might be way too much. For other people, though, it might not be that bad. If you think about $30 a month or so $360 a year, how much does it cost to buy your own laptop? And and when I say a laptop, I don't mean the cheapest one you get at Best Buy, but a decent one. Sure. You know, it's 1000 bucks. So... So is this uh, do you, do you need to have another Windows machine is is that what you're remoting into or it's across it's just, devices it's just mirroring you need to have some kind of hardware locally, mm -hmm. right? But it, right. Could, it could be an iPad. It mm -hmm. could be a Chromebook. It but could I mean, be... I could have just an iPad and yep. and have a Windows experience on that. Then without, I'm not remoting into my Windows computer somewhere else. Uh, that, that's exactly right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So the the computer exists in the cloud, and so what you know, one benefit is using non-standard hardware or non-Microsoft hardware. The other advantage, though, is like if your house burns down, mm -hmm. you, your desktop is in the cloud. So you just go somewhere else and remote in, and all of your data is there. So it kind of gives you that off-site uh, you know, stability and redundancy that you want. One of the things I thought was cool about that is the state, uh, the configuration state stays the same. And what I mean by that is that, let's say Don's logged into a Mac uh, decides, hey, I'm going to pick up the iPad and walk, you know, somewhere in the building and log back into that desktop. The state stays the same across all the devices. Yep. So. Now, uh, it is not right for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say you're a hardcore gamer, mm -hmm. right? And you, you, you're trying to avoid having to buy that high-end video card, which is pretty hard to get right now anyway. Uh, the Windows 365 solution does have a GPU in it, but it's not a high-end one. So mm -hmm. you you can watch videos, you can play some older games, but you're not going to get like ultra settings in, I don't know, whatever version so, of so Battlefield you, is Yeah, out. you can play these games, you will lose very quickly <laughs> yeah. because you are lagging. So for gamers like that, they're better served with uh, like 
the GeForce Now or Microsoft has, I, I forget what their streaming one is called for games. Uh, it's like Xbox Game Pass Ultimate or something like mm-hmm. that. Uh, so, you know, they have different things for that. But if you are a regular person that just uses a Windows computer, <laughs> if you've got productivity, you know, you're doing work type stuff, mm-hmm. uh, it, it'll work out really well. We'll have to see how well this takes off. I know Amazon Workspaces did not really change the market in any way. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to see if Microsoft can make a difference where Amazon didn't. You think they're making the push just because of the hybridized work environment today? Uh, So that's a big part of it, Mm -hmm. right? And I I struggle with this with our, you know, with my day job, Mm -hmm. uh, where when everybody started working remotely, working from home, Mm -hmm. they were taking work computers home. And that means they're now in an unsecured location 24 hours a day. There's a lot of risk. Something like this would would kind of fix that. You know, they go home and use their own computer and remote into a desktop that I fully control that gives you that safety. Now, personally, I, I think we already had that. You know, that was something that was already available to us. So I don't know how well Windows 365 is going to take off. I kind mm-hmm. of feel like it's not going to make a giant splash. So you don't think we should make the, uh, the claim right now, dedicated PCs are gone? No, not, yeah, that, not, that's not, not this quick. That's not going to happen. You yeah. know, I could see it being useful for certain people, but like for me, I'm not giving up my desktop at home. Sure, yeah, yeah. me neither. <laughs> All right. I will uh, hold on to my computer then uh, <laughs> for now. All right, let's move over to Tom'sHardware.com for our next article. Linux kernel nixes IDE support in latest 5.14 release candidate. It's the end of a parallel era. So uh, <laughs> I think help, this is kind of funny, out honestly. One. I, I don't think Peter gets the play on words there. Well, I, I see it. Uh, that, isn't that cable in the picture there? Is that a parallel port something? Yes. Yes. Very okay. good. Look at that. I know what the All joke right, means. I, still did, game. I, I, I didn't get it enough to think it's funny. but <laughs> Now, we know that Linux can have a long shelf life in the business world, right? Yeah. So yeah. would you say that there are probably still business-deployed production machines that are still having these IDE drives? I don't think so, but, uh, you know... A lot of people comment on how Linux can run on really old computers. So if you have an old computer that's no longer supported, you throw Linux on it and it runs great. And that's true. Mm -hmm. But you have to wonder how long they'll support a piece of hardware. And today we get a little bit of visibility into that because SATA, Serial ATA, which is what replaced the uh, parallel ports that Mm -hmm. were used for uh, IDE, SATA was released, I think, out in the public. 2003. Perfect. 2003. Mm -hmm. How do you know that just offhand? Was, it, was that in the I article? Do, it's what I no. It's what okay. I do for a living. He's man. paid to know that stuff. <laughs> so you know that that's eighteen years ago. It is. So eighteen years since the new technology had come out, right? So right. the IDE has been around since the eighties. Mm-hmm. You're talking about forty years. This technology's yep. been out there. Nobody is using IDE hard drives today, right? IDE yep. hard drives had way too many limitations. They're just not in use today. Sure. Um, however, floppy disks. Floppy disks were all IDE, or at least the, you know, the main ones that were, sure. were used in, in companies across the world. And that means that if you still have data, like archival data that's stored on these disks, you can no longer hook that up and expect the Linux kernel to detect that hardware. Now, mm-hmm. you can still run any version of Linux before 5.14, and it'll have that support in there. Or somebody likely will do backports and things to be able to, uh, to port it over to some of the newer kernels. I guess that wouldn't be a backport. That would be a port. <laughs> well, yeah. So, can I just clarify on because the word support uh, it, it can mm-hmm. mean different things? So, when we say they nick support for it, I mean when Microsoft says we're no longer supporting this version of of Windows, you could still run it, and you're just not going to get support when you call. Well, does so this mean that this will not it's removing work it anymore? From the code, if I yeah, believe so this so. is different. This means it's not. Working. This is a little different. Yeah. So yeah. Let, let's say you're running uh, Arch Linux and you've got the five point. 13 kernel and you upgrade to the 5.14 kernel Mm -hmm. all of a sudden your id devices would disappear okay Mm -hmm. right so they'd just be gone now that doesn't mean that somebody isn't going to come along and write a third-party driver that you could load it you know kernel module they could write it and you load it now you got support back sure but the official kernel is no longer going to support it so um you know that that process is kind of important but the real thing here I, i think the the newsworthy thing is that we've got 18 years of support for hardware after yeah. it was no longer considered the standard. It's pretty impressive because you figure the last standard that adjustment that came on to IDE was 2002. You look at 2003 is when SATA came out. I believe it was um, 2007. Intel stopped supporting it, some of their chipsets, and Western Digital stopped supporting it altogether and making the drives in 2013. Yeah. You know, so yeah. it's a long time coming. Yep. So do you still have one of these cables just to show off in like A plus courses? I absolutely do. Yeah, and definitely. Stuff? <laughs> I've got one with the click of death going too, just to show that. What is, I'm sorry, what is the click of death? 
Oh, that's when a hard drive's dying. Oh. Yeah. You've oh, never, oh the, the, the drive is making like a yeah. click. Okay. You've yep. never experienced true sadness. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a day off. To an IT person, though, that's like that's more work. To me, it's like, oh, I guess I don't have to do any work today. <laughs> My computer is smoking. <laughs> but you use Windows 365, so you just go ah, to another computer. Nah, yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Got me now. All right. Uh, let's move over now to ArsTechnica.com for our next article. Google's new Drive app replaces backup and sync with Drive File Stream. The new Drive desktop app is available for Windows and Mac only. So is this kind of, uh, well, what we talked about earlier with Microsoft uh, and Windows 365, that's the whole operating system. This is Drive is more about kind of Office 365. Yeah, they, this is a bit different. So uh, several years ago, you know, Google released what was internally called the G Drive, but they finally mm. just called it Google Drive, uh, that came out, and you had the Google Drive client you run on your machine. And a couple of years back, they replaced it with the Backup and Sync client, which did a lot more than just synchronize your Google Drive. It could also mm. back up folders. Anytime you plugged in a USB key, it would offer to back stuff up into Google Photos and, and do a lot more. And they completely changed the user interface that I, I think most people universally hated. Mm -hmm. uh, but for businesses, it was a challenge because they had to retrain their employees. Well, Google's doing it again. They are changing the client. Uh, it is being renamed. And so now it's just going to be called Drive File Stream, mm -hmm. uh, which is a kind of convoluted name that's going to confuse people. <laughs> it doesn't really add any crazy new features. So it basically has the same functionality as Backup and Sync. Uh, they did add one or two things. Uh, it's got some integration with Microsoft Outlook. You can do Google Meet scheduling inside mm -hmm. of it. Uh, and it has support for Google shared drives. So, you know, when you have multiple Google Drive accounts or just Google accounts uh, and you've got different drives you can share between and it'll all sync in one uh, one app. So there's third party apps that will do that. Like, uh, well, there's one called Sync. It's kind of hard to Google for that one. But uh, <laughs> but but this one will now do it native. So that's kind of what they're pushing. The key reason I wanted to highlight it here is I know a lot of our listeners are system admins. Mm -hmm. And if you're an administrator supporting G Suite in your organization, mm -hmm. right, lots of schools, lots of businesses do, uh, there is a bit of a timer on this. So yep. it is available right now. So home users can upgrade to it right at this moment. But actual business or enterprise accounts for G Suite have a little bit of time. You're basically allowed to get in and test it, mm -hmm. but beginning August 18 is when your users are going to start seeing a prompt to update. It's about two months. Uh, August 18 is faster than you think. Oh, that's only no, a month away. a month away. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And October 1st, now we're talking two months, mm -hmm. uh, October 1st is when they're going to force you to upgrade. The old okay. app will, will cease functioning. So if you need to train your end users, train your employees, update your documentation, now's the time to do it. So if we got a personal account, you'd probably just go ahead and do it. But if you've got one of those business accounts, time to get testing. Yeah, I mean, imagine you've got... 5,000 users sure, or, or 1,000 sure. students or, or whatever. And all of a sudden, this, this key app changes, the app they use to access their files. Uh, now you've you got to train them on how to use it. Sure. Should we go ahead and plan now for the article we'll do in, in two months of everyone up in arms about new change to you know the interface? And... It'll be called the rollback episode. You know, yeah. I, I don't know if that'll happen <laughs> because when they release the backup in sync, Mm -hmm. Like the UI on that is terrible. People just hated it, uh, and Google, as Google does, just ignored all the feedback, and uh, <laughs> and that was that. So, well, even if this is better, I, I feel like people just still complain about change. It doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's true. user acceptance. Yeah, because you'll notice acceptance. like the very thing they complained about now they're complaining a year later because you changed that. Well, that's so. the whole reason I got in IT. I didn't like change. <laughs> there <Perfect>. you go. <laughs> Not regretting that decision at all. No. All right, this next one comes to us from therecord.media, uh, the coveted dot .media uh, <laughs> extension. Gmail uh, deploys support BIMI security standard. Is that is that headline even? A That's sentence? a little messed up. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're deploying support for the BIMI security standard. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, we'll add in those words. But yeah, so what is the that uh, BIMI security standard? I have not heard of that one. All right, so if you haven't heard of it, mm -hmm. Uh, don't be surprised. Uh, it is a new email security technique that allows companies to basically uh, have their corporate logo show up next to an email mm -hmm. to prove that it was sent from one of their authentic servers, that you know it's a legitimate email from that company. The standard is called BIMI, B-I-M-I, -I, and it stands for Basic Indicators for Message Identification.
Nation. And up until recently, it was only supported by a few email providers. Yahoo had support, uh, not not Microsoft. Outlook.com doesn't have it, and Office 365 doesn't have it. But now Google has rolled it out for Gmail. They did some limited testing. They, they tested it on a couple of customers, and then now they're rolling it out across the board. And basically what they found was that it helped people determine whether they could trust an email. Mm -hmm. And for the marketers, they love this. It increased the open rate of email. People were more likely to open an email that had a logo on it. Now, why are we talking about this here? Because who cares about marketing emails? Uh, is, Peter loves these uh, diatribes. <laughs> so the reason we're talking about it here is if you are an email administrator, which a lot of us are, you might get the question tomorrow about, hey, how, how do we get our company logo to show up when we send emails? And the short answer is, uh, you know, anybody can do it, but it's pretty difficult. So mm -hmm. you got to do a few things. First off, you have to have applied the most common security measures for email. So that's DKIM, SPF, and... Uh, DMARC? DMARC. There mm -hmm. we go. Thank yep. you, Wes. Uh, so you have to have those three properly configured and in place. And that means that your email servers are, are basically posted so that people can identify which ones are the authentic servers, that that record is digitally signed, and connections to the server use that digital key that you've shared out. So some basic things that everybody should be doing anyway, right? Mm -hmm. You should have those things in place. If you do, then you can go out and buy a, uh, a, 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 shoot, what's the certificate called for this one? A VMC or something mm -hmm. like that. You know, a verified merchant certificate or something. I, I might be making that acronym up, but but it's a, a special certificate that is what BIMI relies on. And the, the certificate provider, there's only a couple, Digicert is one of them. Like Digicert will verify your company, will verify you own the trademark on the logo, and then issue the certificate for the low, low cost of $1,500 a year. So it's not exactly cheap. Considering Let's Encrypt is like basically free, this is going to cost you $1,500. Uh, and then after that, you can submit to Google or Yahoo or whatever to have them recognize this. There's not a unified way to submit to all the email servers that are out there. And even then, the logos will only show up in Gmail and Yahoo and those mail providers. So they won't show up in people's local clients or on their iPhone or, or whatever. So this is a very emerging technology, kind of a new thing that's coming out. Because it touches marketing and sales, I feel like this is going to be successful. This is going to happen. So if you're an email, email administrator, now's the time to look into it. Do you have DKIM, DMARC, SPF set up for your domain? Have you looked into getting a certificate? You know, this is something that'll be coming down the road. So I know that you know, my boss listens to this show because <laughs> uh, she tells me everything I've, I've said wrong each week. Um, <laughs> so I, I'll just go ahead and ask the questions that I know I'll, I will get. When you say, you know, that you talked about the steps that you need to do and ensure that have been done in, on your, your settings, is that on your settings as, as, as far as your domain? Or a lot of people use MailChimp, HubSpot, you know, Pardot, things like sure. that to send out mail on their behalf. Are we talking about their servers that need to have those things? So it's place? kind of both. Some things like SPF, right? The sender policy framework, that's just a text record you create in your DNS zone. So you can figure that in your DNS server and you knock that out. Uh, DMARC and DKIM, on the other hand, you've got to generate a certificate or a, you know, a key mm -hmm. that you generate on your email server. Uh, and and uh, like Mailgun or SendGrid, they, they could generate those keys as well. And then you take those keys and you put them in your DNS records. So, you know, it's a little bit of both. Some mm -hmm. work on the mail server side, some work on the DNS server side. And once you've got it in place, it kind of locks things down. Yeah. So will you think this will help to mitigate, you know, the risk of some of the domain impersonations that are going on? That's the idea. Sure. But I, I don't know how effective it'll be because, like— I. Because just because I don't see that that Bank of America logo, I don't know if Bank of America has set that up. Right. Sure, sure. I guess if I'm it, used to seeing it, and then I don't, maybe I, it, it would... I don't know. I mean, I would have to receive like two emails. I'd have to have two emails in my inbox to look and say, oh, that one has the logo and this other one doesn't. Yeah. Mm, right. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how effective this will be. But then a lot of times you'll see like the sender and that one is from the different server or so. You know, this one came from marketing. This one came from accounting. This, you know. Yeah, you know, you'd like to think that, but you know, a lot of times the from address that the client shows you is not the actual yeah. from address; it's the display name, and so those get faked all the time. So there's a lot of challenges to it. I don't think, from a security perspective, that this will really be effective. Mm -hmm. I think that DKIM and DMARC by themselves are already effective for a mm -hmm. lot of this, uh, but it makes a fancy logo show up and it makes people open email. So yeah, that's... they shouldn't call it the BIMI security standard. They should call it like the BIMI marketing feature <laughs> or something because it's that's that's what it is, it, yeah. it, at least at this point, until everyone is on it, and then for, all of a sudden you don't see the logo. But uh, all right, good, good.
good one, and I'm sure I'll get some work out of that one. Thanks, Don. Uh, all right, our next article is actually from our Deja News segment, but I feel like I've got a better intro to play for this one, so let me let me just play this. Oh. <laughs> because this is a prediction that Don made on our end of the year show, I want to say in 2019 I originally. Think so, yeah. uh, so uh, this is from ZDNet.com. Say hi to Microsoft's own Linux, CBL Mariner. Microsoft has its own Linux distribution, and yes, you can download, install, and run it. In fact, you may want to do just that. So, uh, Don, this this doesn't sound, though, like a full-blown, like uh, not not something you'd have as a daily driver. Mm-hmm. It's more like a container or something like that. So I, I got to say, I, you know, I, I made the prediction back in 2019. I said, I, I really see Microsoft releasing their own distribution of Linux that they maintain and support and that customers can use because they had started porting a lot of their stuff, like Microsoft SQL, over to run on Linux. And Linux was being deployed on over 50% of the virtual machines launched in Azure. So there's just this obvious need for it to be there. Well, they didn't. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't release it in 2019. They didn't release it in 2020. And we got really close at the end of 2020 when they released Azure Sphere, mm-hmm. which uses a Linux uh, distro under the hood that Microsoft does support. But it was really just designed for Azure Sphere, and that's it. So I didn't count that as the uh, kind of fulfillment of that prediction. Well, now we're really, really close. I think we're close enough that we can go ahead and stick a, uh, stick a fork in this when it's done uh, with CBL Mariner. CBL stands for Common Base Linux. And what happened was Microsoft found they were deploying so much stuff on Linux that they needed a common base, a common distro that they could deploy on so that they could support it across their whole environment, not just Azure Sphere, but in all of their Azure properties and the other things they're using Linux for internally, which is quite a bit. And so that's where they came up with CBL. They made a lot of decisions that surprised me, though. And I I think as recently as last month here on this podcast, I made comments about how Microsoft has partnered so closely with Canonical. And Mm -hmm. so you see Ubuntu used through so much of what they do. WSL is almost entirely done on Ubuntu these days. So I just assumed that when they released their own distro that it would be based off of Ubuntu somehow, or maybe Debian, since that's who Ubuntu bases off of. But they didn't, right? So they actually did something kind of crazy. They based their distro off of Photon OS, which is a security-focused Linux distribution. Mm -hmm. So very, very streamlined, very minimal, right? No cruft uh, included with the default install. uh, Small, secure, Mm -hmm. efficient. And then they borrowed from Fedora DNF. Uh, which is the the dandified package manager that that uh, Fedora uses, and because they're trying to be tiny, because they're trying to keep a minimal feature set, they actually kind of recreated it as TDNF or Tiny DNF, which actually was another project they brought in. Uh, but they combined that to create Mariner, which is their CBL that they have now, and it's posted in a GitHub repository. You can connect to it, uh, clone the GitHub repo, and build either VHDs or an ISO image, and you can go and install it. It has a graphical installer if you build the ISO. It does not have a GUI in the actual OS, though. It's a command line install because it's designed to be used for servers. Mm -hmm. So this is not like a, a workstation thing, but it is a distro that's released, managed, and maintained by Microsoft and you know, here it is. They now have a Linux distro. Balmer didn't see that coming. <laughs> there have been a lot of comments about that. You know, that here it is, and it's GPL that's open source, sure. and it's it's a lot of things that the Balmer wouldn't have done. But that's right. It's a different technology world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just checking, it seems that my prediction from that same episode did not come true, which was five-factor authentication, um, which was, yeah, I think, email, or, I mean, your password, your PIN, um, a prick of, of blood, blood from your yeah, finger, you gotta have blood. a retinal scan, and then like a letter from your mom, I think is what it was. I'll have to go back and listen. So unfortunately, <laughs> uh, I did not get mine. Uh, yeah. You need to update that, like a text message from your mom. There we go. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It could yeah. be more. Yeah. Modernized. That, that could be why it's not happening. <laughs> we need to go back, though. I want to see what uh, what Daniel and I, I, I think Justin would have been there at that time, too, what their predictions were. But I think this is the first one uh, to come true. So congratulations to better, you, Don. Better late than never, I guess. <laughs> well, you were right. I mean, if you could have also predicted that Microsoft would be slow in their release. Yeah. I, I still see this going further. Like, I do not see a purpose for Microsoft Windows Server anymore. 
Mm -hmm. And I mean, you know, they still make it. Lots of people use it. It makes a great file server, whatever. But Windows Server doesn't do anything unique anymore. And it actually holds you back. Technologies mm -hmm. like Docker and stuff don't work as well on top of Windows as they do on top of Linux. So I, I just, I see Microsoft going all in on this uh, yeah. eventually. And basically what you're saying is Microsoft isn't even using Microsoft Server for a lot of their yeah. physical servers. Absolutely. That, yep. that are in Azure. So if they're not doing it, why, why would you? <laughs> all right. We've got uh, a lot of stuff coming up. Um, I'll tell you about a couple ones. First of all, uh, CompTIA free weekend from IT Pro TV, meaning you can go in and see all of the CompTIA courses, A+, Net+, Security+, Pentest, SISA, Linux+, Plus, Cloud, uh, CASP, uh, uh, nine more after that. Uh, you can go <laughs> check all those out uh, July 24th and 25th. Just make a free account on IT Pro TV. Get in there and play around, see what you think um, of all that good stuff. Uh, also, we have, let's see, um, Jeopardy uh, coming up as well on the 30th of this month. We're going to do uh, a live event. So you've created that free account. You can come and watch in the on-air page. Um, Don is the host. Uh, Wes is uh, competing. I can't wait. And, it's going to be fun. Uh, are you the reigning champ? No, uh, no, it was the guest last time that, that won yeah. on the certain Nexus one, I believe. <laughs> uh, but you did uh, have more points than that. Well, everyone had more points Maybe than Maybe you're just predicting the future. That could be what it is. There we go. <laughs> yeah. But you're you're playing against Adam and Ronnie, so... Um, That's right. It's going to be fun. Which is great, because you guys are actually all people that have taught come to your courses um, right. here at ITP TV, so we'll get a chance to see that, and that takes place, like I said, on the 30th at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so check that out. And uh, Peter and I wrote all the questions for it, so if the questions suck, you know who to blame. Well, I wrote the Lame. questions and you fixed them. So <laughs> you were the last eyes on them. Uh, but then again, I still have to put them into the Jeopardy system now, which gives me another chance to screw them up. So there you go. we'll see. Uh, I guess the, the last blame falls on me. Um, also, a webinar coming up this week uh, that is Thursday, July 22nd. First look at the updated CompTIA CASP Plus. Head over to itpro.tv slash webinars. You can sign up for that one. Uh, it takes place at 2 p.m. Eastern time. will be archived as well if you are listening to this after the fact. Uh, uh, and the next webinar we've already got scheduled is how apprenticeships help employees and employers. CompTIA apprenticeships are powering and diversifying the IT workforce. That's taking place on Thursday, August 5th at 2 p.m. Eastern time with Amy Cardell, uh, who I believe is a CompTIA um, person herself. So uh, definitely another cool one. All of those are at itpro.tv slash webinars. And then let's see if I mentioned everything. Uh, yeah, I think so. The free weekend. Uh, yeah. And then head over to technado.com and you can uh, send in some listener mail. Uh, tell us the, all the ways we've forsaken you. And uh, you can also click the big orange button that says sponsored by IT Pro TV and get a 30% off coupon code for the lifetime of your personal plan. That's more marketing than we've done in every episode combined. <laughs> it's good stuff, though. It'll be fun. Yeah. yeah, I think all that is true also. I think I got all the dates right. There was one week where I did say like a webinar that happened two weeks ago, but wah, wah. not this week. <laughs> well, Wes, thank you again. Yeah, uh, anytime you guys in. want. Yeah, I it's mean, been fun. You know, there, I, I don't know what squatters' rights are, but there comes a point where that's just your that's your seat. Hey, <laughs> that's right. So, we'll see. And Don, welcome back. Good to have you again. And uh, thank you for you know whatever you did today showing up for my own show yeah thank you, <laughs> thank you for the bare minimum of showing up no you deserve, you deserve raises vacation. the bar and thank you to snehal and tani uh from horizon 3.ai check them out and we will see you guys uh next week for the next tech with don pizzette <laughs>